context by way of introduction. AMHP or AMP and our mixed uh, methods research team have been following the spread and development of Muslim community-based health organizations. have been following the uh, development of Muslim community-based health organizations for more than a decade. Sparked by a recent collaboration with documentary filmmakers who produced the film Unconditional Care about the Mass Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. We have now conducted two national surveys and compiled a directory and interactive map that is being revised and updated on AMP's website. Please check it out. We also plan to conduct deeper ethnographic studies of individual clinics in the near future. Sayed Hussein, who is the new Muslim Free Clinics coordinator for AMP, will invite you in the chat to join our listserv and WhatsApp group for what we are calling the Muslim Free Clinics Council. The goal is to coordinate, build capacity, and share resources across the Muslim Free Clinic landscape in the United States. We'd like to thank our partner, Islamic Relief USA, for making this webinar possible. Please stay tuned after our presenters we will hear a brief but important message from Donia Abdullah from IRUSA about upcoming funding opportunities for Muslim free clinics. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. We'll have a short question and answer session at the end. Please type your questions in the chat. Our speakers will try to address any questions we don't get to after the session ends as well. And note that this webinar will be posted on the American Muslim Health Professionals website. So tonight we have the great honor of having the Health Resources Consultants team with us. Dr. Constance Shabazz is an experienced clinician, administrator, healthcare management consultant, and chief medical officer coach and mentor, who's worked in a number of community health centers. She has over 40 years of experience in the healthcare services field. She serves as a clinical consultant for Healthcare Health Resources Services Administration, HRSA, and the Bureau of Primary Healthcare. Mr. Dan Miles is a financial consultant who has worked with approximately one third of the nation's FQHCs while conducting more than 600 site visits. He was HRSA's most highly utilized consultant for performance improvement studies. Dan has assisted health centers in merger and acquisition of new practices, mentored financial management staff, developed financial recovery plans, and provided tools for use by health center staff to enhance performance. And finally, Mr. Jimmy Brown serves as an administrator, administration and governments, governance expert with the health resources consultants and as a technical assistance consultant for the National Association of Community Health Centers. Jimmy previously served as the president and chief executive officer for Indianapolis-based HealthNet, Inc., an FQHC that provided care to over 61,000 patients per year over 37 sites. Jimmy is an expert in healthcare policies and procedures, board training and development, governance, healthcare operations and practice management, affiliation agreements and leadership development. So without further ado, Dr. Shabazz, take it away. Welcome to everyone. Well, welcome everyone. And I wanna thank AMHP for this wonderful opportunity to pre present this afternoon. And so our, our topic is about, you know, sustainability and growth of, through the FQHC program for Muslim-led organizations. And I just wanna say that uh, our comments today are not gonna be limited to uh, Muslim-led organizations, but actually apply to any organization that is interested in becoming a federally qualified healthcare center. So what is a community health center? Well, this is a community-based and uh, patient-directed organization. Uh, they're typically addressing the needs of uh, underserved populations or vulnerable populations. Uh, they address the economics uh, needs um, and, and de uh, demands. The, they uh, meet the uh, requirements in terms of cultural bar uh, barriers, in terms of helping to bridge those gaps. Uh, they provide comprehensive, uh, culturally competent and, and high quality primary care services. 
Now, health centers are that, such as this have an integrated model or one-stop shop model that provides access, not just to the basic primary care, but also to things such as pharmacy services, mental health, substance abuse disorder treatment, and oral health services. And in addition, they provide other wraparound services uh, which are, are more supportive in nature, such as health education, translation, and transportation. Now, what are federally qualified health centers? Well, these are health centers that are either private or, or nonprofit public in, or public entities. They can include tribal and faith-based organizations. And they have a unique requirement to have a board composition that consists of 51% of its voting members have to be actual users of or consumers of the health centers, what we call in scope services. So an exclusion for someone being a direct user would be someone who's also a, a guardian of a user or consumer of those services. Another thing that's required and part of the fundamentals is that people, uh, individuals who receive their services are provided services regardless as to their ability to pay. And these health centers are either funded through the federal government or they receive an enhanced financial um, payment through public insur insurances such as Medicaid and Medicare to be able to cover the cost of care for low income, uninsured or underinsured individuals. And they must meet specific requirements, either clinically, financially, as well as in their uh, governance and administration. So a little bit about the history of the, the uh, community health centers or FQHCs. They actually came out of the civil rights movement and back in what was called the Freedom Summer in Mississippi where there, there was an aggressive voter registration program going on. There were a number of individuals who came there including uh, a lot of activists uh, in the healthcare arena. One was Dr. Jack Geiger. He was a physician and a civil rights um, activist. And he came with members of his organization. Uh, they were there helping out with the healthcare of some, many of the people who were engaged in the, in the voter registration process. They found though that there was severe poverty and health inequities in, this was in the Mississippi Bayou area. And so that, Dr. Geiger had, had the opportunity as part of his, his education to visit South Africa some years uh, prior to that. And he saw this wonderful community health center model, which was way beyond just providing uh, physical health, but also dealing with things such as uh, food insecurity or improving the sanitation in those areas. So he was able to get money from the federal government uh, under the War on Poverty program to start and launch a program at the Delta, or it was called the Delta Health Center uh, to uh, demonstrate this model. Simultaneously in Boston, there was the, the development of the first fully operable uh, community health center in a housing project in the Columbia Point neighborhood in Boston. So that's the genesis of the community health center or FQHC program. So what's, fast forward, what is the impact that this program has had? There are close to 1400 community health center organizations with over 10,000 sites. They're located in every state, every US territory and the District of Columbia. And they provide a, a medical home for over 30 million people or one in 11 individuals in the US. Recently, the, the community health centers or the FQACs played a very significant role during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so through them, uh, many people received testing and treatment and contact tracing and now the vaccinations. And there are plans to expand the number of community health centers because of the growing demand. Now let's talk a little bit about the federally qualified healthcare center and how the, uh, the program is, is designed. It has four areas or special that address special populations. And I'm not gonna go through this uh, uh, you know, de in detail, but the, the sections are E, G, H, and I, and they cover like community health centers, cover uh, pretty much provide services for all um, individuals. But then they wanted to be sure that they, that they were addressing the needs of other special populations as, as, as migrant and season, seasonal agricultural workers a homeless population and residents of the public housing. And there are some differences in the way that these are funded and, re and requirements to become uh, one of these sections. Let's now talk about the two arms of the federally qualified healthcare program. The first one is called the lookalike program. And I was, you know, I'm humored by that term, but now you'll see why. 
The Lookalike Program is a federally qualified health center designation for health centers that do not receive direct grant funds. So they look like a granted um, program, but you do not receive those, those direct grant funds. What you do receive through this designation is the ability as a health center to bill public insurances, Medicaid and Medicare, and be reimbursed at a higher or enhanced reimbursement rate, which is called the Federally Qualified Healthcare Center Prospective Payment System. And the reason why uh, the, the feds do that is to help you as a, a health center to generate um, uh, additional revenue to take care of those low income, uninsured and underinsured individuals. But remember, you do not receive direct grant dollars. These are basically indirect dollars. So what are the eligibility criteria for these lookalikes? Well, you have to be a 501c3, you have to have that 51% user consumer board composition. And, and I highlighted this because you need to be fully operable for six months before you can apply. So that means that you have to have all of the required services that the Bureau requires for you to get this designation in fully, full operation. And we'll go into more detail later. And you must be fully compliant with all of the eligibility requirements during that time period of six months. What are the eligibility criteria for a 330 grantee? Well, these are the health centers that receive grant dollars, direct grant dollars. Still the 501c3, still the 51% user consumer board composition. But interesting enough, you are not required to be fully operable prior to your application submission. So what happens is if you are approved for the grant, you have up to 180 days after you receive what's called the notice of award or NOI of the grant to be able to bring everything into compliance. So all of the hours of operation, uh, uh, providing all of the services that are required in a way that meets what, what we call the program requirement compliance. Let's talk a little bit about the application process and how they differ between the lookalike and the 330 grantee. With the lookalike, interesting enough, you can apply at any time, 24 seven. But as we said earlier, you must be fully operable. And we talked about that six month period. So that means that you must have 40 hours a week of, of, of uh, services available to your patients and meeting all of those program requirements that we talked about. So what happens after you submit your application, it is reviewed by a, a separate office. It's called the Lookalike Program Office. And if you are approved for that initial phase, then you move on to the next phase, which is you will have a site visit. Now, of course, we know in the middle of COVID that the on-site visits are not uh, taking place as they used to. And so now they're, they're basically virtual. And the time period from the time that your uh, application is reviewed and approved and when you have the, type, uh, the site visit has changed because of the restrictions of COVID. So once that is done, if you have a successful site visit and you have all the documentation that meets the requirement, then there's a, a, a designation, a lookalike designation determination. Now for the application process for the 330 grant, well, this is very highly competitive and there is no set schedule of when these uh, grant opportunities are announced. The last one was actually in uh, January 20. 2019. And I just want to say, I'm proud to say that I and my colleagues work with other teams, uh, consultant teams, and we work with uh, the Inner City Muslim Action Network, or, or Iman as, as you know it, and they were actually awarded a lookalike designation and 16 months later were able to get a uh, 330 grant. And they were actually the only health center in uh, Illinois that got that designation both, the, I'm sorry, the, the, the grant that particular year. So we're proud to say that we are part of that. So the application process itself is, is basically two parts and it's typically uh, carried over a four month uh, period to submit all the in information and documentation in the application. And in, in normal times, pre-COVID, it would probably take somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six months after, after the submission to get the um, uh, approval or, or a decline uh, their the submission so um the site visit though that does um occur afterwards is one to make sure that within that 180 days or now with COVID, and maybe up to 12 months that the health center has become in in compliance is fully operable so let's look at some of the pros and cons of uh, the lookalike versus 
the uh, 330 grant. The pros for lookalike is you can uh, apply at any time. It, it, it gives you the potential for increased revenue through the, the building of those Medicaid and Medicare uh, uh, patients. Uh, you have the eligibility to apply for the 340B drug pricing program. And this is a wonderful program where the health center is able to access uh, uh, prescription drugs at deep discounts. And this improves the access and affordability of these prescription drugs to particularly your low income patients. And it's also a potential gen a revenue generator for the health center. The health center uh, lookalikes are eligible for the vaccine for children program, which gives, uh, increases access to free vaccines to uninsured and uninsured children. And also it's, it makes the health center uh, eligible for uh, placement of National Health Service Corps scholars and loan repayment scholars. So it's really a, um, a way of increasing your workforce for your health center. And last but not least, uh, the, the unfortunately with the lookalikes, you're not, they do receive training and technical assistance but you know, don't have access to the, the other grants that um, being a grantee would open up the opportunities for. So pros for the 330 uh, grantees, you don't have to be fully operable or, or in full compliance prior to the application submission. And if you receive the award, the first of the uh, initial award is gonna be 300, I'm sorry, $650,000 a year. And you're eligible for one-time capital improvement, not to be confused that you could go out and build a, a new facility, but things like, you know, maybe you, you need to get a new uh, IT system or EMR system, uh, maybe redesign your existing structure. And that's $150,000 the first year. You're also eligible for the Federal Tort Claim Act, FTCA. And this is very, very important and very valuable to a health center because this is a malpractice coverage um, insurance for the staff and board members to cover any acts of errors or, or, or omission. And so it's a, a great way for the health center to save a lot of money, particularly like say, for example, an ob guiding, in which you know, their insurance may be $150,000, $200,000 a year. And it allows that health center to use those funds for other things, maybe expanding the, the uh, services for your patients. Another thing uh, is, uh, like we said, for the, the uh, lookalikes, access to the 340B pricing program, the National Health Service Corps and loan repayment scholar placement. And in this instance, this is where you are eligible for other federal grants and programs. And recently we've had a lot of, seen a lot of money uh, and grant opportunities uh, put out there for mental health and opioid addiction. So what are some of the cons? Well, with a lookalike, we talked about being in full compliance for at least six months prior to the ap application submission. You do not receive the direct funding. So that means that the enhancement only comes based on the number of Medicaid and Medicare patients that you were able to bill and get reimbursed for. And not eligible for the Federal Tort Claim Act coverage and not eligible for most HRSA grants. So what are the cons on, on the 330 grantee side? Very competitive. Uh, there's something called the service area overlap. So that means you may be in competition with other health centers who are looking to serve the same, same population, not both number wise as, as well as the type of, of uh, population. And the timing of the grant application notices are unpredictable. Like I said, the last one was almost two years ago. And we know because of COVID, that there's a high likelihood because of that time period that, that, that they are going to be um, uh, putting out a, a, a notice of a war. We just don't know when. So now let's just briefly talk about compliance requirements. You heard me uh, keep talking about this. you have to be in compliance. I'm just going to go over um, the clinic, and, but there are clinical compliance areas, fiscal, uh, governance, and administrative. So as far as the clinical requirements are concerned, there are five of them. These are five clinical areas, and we're just going to briefly go over that. So there are 15 to 16 required services that a health center must provide, and they must be provided in at least one of these three ways. The first one is directly. In other words, that you have your employed staff who receive a W-2 or non-paid vol volunteers provide the service, or the second one is uh, through a contracted purchase agreement where someone or an entity uh, may receive a 1099. They're not an employed person, but they're providing the service. The third is through an unpaid referral arrangement. Okay, and this is where 
you are referring patients to uh, a, a provider and they are not uh, receiving any kind of payment from, from you or the health center. These services though also must be provided in a culturally and linguistically appropriate manner for the patient population that you are serving. And I just wanna make a note here that when we talked about these required services, with this grant or, or with this designation, you, you are required to provide a, a, a subset of those 15 to 16 services, but that does not uh, preclude you as a health center from providing other services that extend beyond that. The second one is clinical staffing. So that means you must have the adequate number and type of specialties, in other words, pediatrics, ob gyne and the like. Now, how, how that is provided, like we talked about, it could be direct or with a contract or with a referral. And you must credential and privilege all your clinical staff, not your, uh, your admin staff, but these are people who provide uh, some direct clinical care to your patients. And this even includes those staff, like for example, in some states, um, medical assistants and dental assistants are not required to have a license or registration or certification. You still have to credential them. And you must have assurances that any of your contractors or refer uh, referral providers have been determined to be licensed, certified or registered and fit and competent to carry out the contracted services. The third required area is the coverage for medical emergencies during and after hours. So you must make sure that you have systems in place to address any, and manage any emer emergencies that occur during the regular hours. We're not saying that you're, you're gonna be running uh, an, uh, an ER or a, an ICU, but be able to stable, stabilize patients. Also, the staff must be either uh, basic life support certified or trained or some comparable training or certification. You must have also arrangements to address urgent or emerging uh, uh, medical issues even after the, uh, the uh, regular hours of operation. And so that means that uh, you need to be able to have systems in place whereby if a patient or a patient's representative or a guardian calls in, that they won't just be talking to someone who uh, through the non-medical answering service, but that actually is a licensed professional who will be able to address their problems. And the reason why the Bureau has required this because we found that a lot of people, because they don't have that after hours access, they, they find that there's over the utilization of a, a hospital emergency room. The fourth one is continuity of care and hospital admitting. And this is where the health center has to have arrangements with hospitals for emergency room and inpatient care for all life cycles of the health center patients. And this can be either provided uh, through the health center's own providers who may have admitting privileges or other uh, agreements like hospital list agreements or some other uh, contractual agreements for somebody to cover the patients uh, for the health center. And systems to refer, track, and follow up of these hospitalized patients or patients who've received ER visits. And then this is the last one. And this is a quality improvement assurance. You must have an active quality improvement assurance program. So that means that as a health center, you must be constantly, you know, uh, determining patient satisfaction, uh, be sure that you are uh, reporting out any patients, patient grievances and addressing them accordingly, uh, incident reporting, performance outcomes of your, your clinical measures and non-clinical measures, provider performance like peer reviews, performance evaluations, and have a solid risk management system. And the last item is you must have a process for communicating with management and board of directors information about quality outcomes and informing us is assist them in their decision making. These health centers are, are, are actually run by the staff, but also the oversight, the ultimate oversight uh, site rather is the board of directors. And so in order for them, particularly because they are 51% uh, of them are users of the health center, in order for them to do their due diligence, they need good communication with what's happening with the health center, um, how the health center is performing, and they are the eyes and ears for the patients who uh, you utilize the health center services. So that uh, ends my part of the presentation. Uh, don't forget to put your questions in, in the chat and we uh, look forward to answering them later on in the program. And I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dan Mile, the fiscal consultant.
and on mute. Mute. Yeah, mute. thank you. It's thank it's you, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me let me go back. Um, you have to have signing fees for for anything that has a fee attached that's in your scope. So if you put it in scope, you must have uh, no charge or a nominal charge only for patients out or below 100% of poverty. You must have at least three levels of discount for patients whose income is greater than 100% of poverty and up to or, or uh, in, inclusive or including 200% of poverty. Uh, but what you must specifically discount is services. Uh, services that are, are in scope have to, be, have to be discounted, basically your labor in providing a service. If there are additional things that are supplies that are not considered part of the standard of care, then if you choose to and you're financially able to, you may discount those, but you're under no requirement. Um, let me see. Uh, discounts are required regardless of mode of delivery. Uh, health centers understand that the things they do directly, they have to discount. They don't always understand that, that those referred services are also included in the requirements. It doesn't matter if you provide it or if you refer it out and pay for it or refer it out and don't pay for it. You must still have uh, a provision for signing fee discounts that fit a, a specific uh, structure. Uh, and so if you have things on your, in your scope that are voluntary things, things that you've chosen uh, to include in, uh, in, in your official scope of service, if you can't get a discount for them, my advice would be take them out. Still use those referral mechanisms, but don't make them part of the, of the health center project or, or you may have a compliance issue you can't uh, overcome. Um, the board defines your sign uh, fee policy. Uh, uh, it, the board des defines what constitutes family and what constitutes uh, um, uh, family slash household and what constitutes income. And so you want to be careful to make sure that what we call income really is. You know, you wouldn't ask about money in your bank account. That's not income. That's an asset. You wouldn't ask about the value of loans you receive. That's debt. You, you, you're looking for, uh, for income primarily. Health centers look at cash income. A few of them have chosen to also include the value of food stamps, but they're really the minority. Mostly, we just look at cash income. Uh, when you look at family size, uh, you want to carefully define that so it makes sense and so that what the eligibility staff do is going to comply with what the board said. Uh, as an example, uh, one of the common definitions I see is uh, a family is two or more people living together who are related by blood or marriage. Seems pretty simple, but let's say we have just two people living together. They're not married, so there's there's no there's no marriage relationship, and if there are no children, nobody in the household is related by blood either. Uh, and so technically, they would be two households, but in practice, what usually happens is front desk asks about everybody's income, and we we treat that as 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 one family. And so we just want to be careful that uh, that what we do. Is, uh, is, is exactly what the board said. And if it's not, but if it is what the board intended, then we need to have the board go back and modify the definition. Um, so again, out or below 100% of poverty, we can have uh, a fixed nominal fee only or no charge. And the determination of, of what constitutes a fixed, uh, a, a nominal fee, a token fee, uh, Is, um, is is something we, we get uh, patient feedback for. We, we have to solicit the opinion of, of patients as to whether our nominal fee is nominal. Uh, we have to uh, uh, we have to periodically review that to be sure that uh, what we think is a nominal fee does not appear to be creating a barrier to care. And for uh, for patients who are above 200% of poverty, we can't offer a slide fee. Sorry, my screen is a little slow. Okay. Um, also, uh, patients with third-party coverage. We have a lot of uh, patients who are nominally insured and, and that their insurance may or may not be worth much to them in a practical setting. Uh, there may be large unmet deductibles. There may be uncovered services. 
if someone is is out or below 200 percent of poverty they uh, they may qualify for our, our sliding fee discount and if they are insured then their out-of-pocket charge should be the lesser of either their copay or the amount that our sliding fee schedule would dictate for them um, periodically we have to evaluate the sliding fee discount program you can do it annually most uh uh, many health centers have, have they, they vacillate between one and three years, but you have to do it at least once every three years. And when you do that evaluation, you're also now required to have utilization data that allows you to demonstrate whether patients at each of your discount pay classes appear to be accessing services. And if you find that there are disparities, then, uh, then you're expected to go back and, 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 and look for uh, why that is, see if, if you have... Uh, unintentionally created financial barriers and make changes uh, accordingly. Okay, contracts and subawards. Most of this is not gonna to apply to, to, uh, uh, to lookalikes. And, and the reason being that, that there is no, no federal interest to be served. And so for the most part, there's a little bit about general contracting procedures that will apply. But, uh, uh, but as you look at the, the questions and if you look at the compliance manual and, and look in uh, particular at the at the operational site visit protocol, which is that list of, of, of uh, 98 or so questions you have to answer. Um, look at the prefatory language that, that tells you whether they're talking specifically about your use of a federal award, and then you'll know if it applies to you or not. Uh, but in any case, you should have written procurement procedures that, that support fair and open competition uh, and include only allowable costs. You want to be sure to include a reference to 45 CFR uh, 75 subpart E, which is the federal cost principles. Uh, required provisions. Uh, you, your contract should identify the specific deliverables. What are the goods uh, to be pro uh, provided? What are the services that are to be performed? Uh, there should be an indication of how you're going to monitor contractor performance. Uh, you want to be sure to list any, any data reporting expectations you have. Uh, in, in particular, those things that, that you're required to uh, report to HRSA through an annual UDS report. And then lastly, uh, this fourth bullet is the thing I find most often is missing uh, in vendor contracts is reference to three years uh, retention. The, the standard for financial records is you're going to hold on to those records for three years uh, um, uh, post expenditure uh, so that there's a, an available uh, audit trail if it's requested. Um, this contract, this, this chapter of the compliance manual also looks at sub awards. There are not many sub awards, maybe 5% or less of, of, of grantees have sub awardees. And the reason is it's it's, it's it just administratively a lot more burdensome. Subawardee has the same relationship with HRSA as the original awardee. Uh, they have to meet all the same, all the same requirements, uh, including board composition. They gotta be 51% consumer majority board. Um, they are responsible for running their assigned portion of the program. Uh, in, in lieu of of subawards, most health centers find they're better served by having contracts. It's just administratively a lot simpler, and and uh, and and it also puts more of the direct control for compliance into the hands of the awardee. Um, financial management accounting systems. We got to have systems that meet GAAP that uh, that protect our assets that uh, that have necessary internal controls, create separation of duties, uh, that support financial stability. And those systems have to have the capacity uh, to account for our use of, uh, of, of the health center project funds. Uh, again, this, if we're talking about the 330 award, as, as HRSA usually is, when it talks about federal funds, it usually means specifically $330. Uh, then obviously that wouldn't apply to a lookalike. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, just, just keep that in mind. If you were to be awarded fe federal funds, you've got to be able to segregate income and expense transactions involving the $330 separately and apart from everything else. Uh, 
you must have, have provisions also for safeguarding your assets uh, and, and, and for property management. You've got, for example, you need to do a physical inventory at least once every two years. Um, if again, if you are awarded federal dollars, you have to have written procedures for drawdown, disbursement, and expenditure that minimize the time elapsing from the time you, you draw the funds from HRSA until you disperse them. Uh, and that also limits the drawdown to what you need to cover your allowable project costs. Uh, if you, health centers are usually expected to submit an annual audit uh, and, and any that uh, trip the threshold of 750,000 or more in federal funds must also have an attachment P or a single audit uh, as, as part of that annual engagement. Um, oftentimes there will be findings. The fact that you may have audit findings, you may have uh, material weaknesses or, or significant efficiencies you need to address. That in itself is 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 not uh, not an uncommon event. The important thing is that your uh, your response to those findings will reflect that you have have taken or are have planned for uh, corrective action that will mitigate or or uh, or, or alleviate that uh, that finding. Uh, document use of non grant funds. Many times health centers are engaged in, in uh, multiple activities. They may have multiple income streams, different services they have, some of which may be in the project, some of which are not. If you have activities that are outside of the scope of the health center project, uh, that's perfectly fine. You, but you must be able to show that those, those things uh, operate uh, on on the revenues on, on that uh, that they generate, or or in other sources of revenues that don't detract from what uh, is used to support the health center, and and then uh, if you do have these these uh, these out of scope activities, um, they should you should be able to show that in some manner they benefit the, the patient population you're striving to serve, uh, which is a, a pretty broad requirement really. Uh, so that they're benefiting the patient population and that you are not doing anything specifically prohibited by the health center. Okay, billing and collections. We are supposed to have robust systems in place to uh, maximize collections for billable services. We are to have fee schedules that are designed basically to do two things. They are, they are designed to offset our reasonable costs in providing care uh, and uh, perhaps more importantly, they should mirror uh, costs for light charges that are uh, uh, that are found in the in the uh, setting in which we practice. So, in the competitive market, our rates uh, should look similar to rates charged by other providers. Um, and we are expected to have uh, evidence of our participation in insurance programs. That usually doesn't doesn't pose any, any difficulty. Uh, we just need to be in those plans that it makes sense for us to be in uh, public and private. Uh, we have to have systems to educate patients on, on insurance coverage options, uh, systems for billing uh, that, are, uh, that are effective, that are, you know, that are, are, are yielding uh, results commensurate with our goal of maximizing our, our, our revenues. Um, and, but at the same time, don't create a barrier to care that, that don't deny patient care based on inability to pay. And so we, we're expected to have things like uh, payment options, payment plans, grace periods. Uh, we may or may not offer cash incentives or same day, uh, same day payment incentives. Those are options that health centers use to improve their overall collection rates. But those, those last two are not mandatory. Um, we have to have policies and procedures in place for waiving or reducing fees. This is for uh, health centers. Uh, this this is, is for patients who have uh, some extraordinary, uh, exceptional hardship. Um, most of our patients are poor. Being poor is not a hardship, uh, not for purposes of, of fee waiver. Uh, but having just lost everything you own in a fire would be. And so it, this, this is a policy that would be open to uh, any patient uh, who, who, who may potentially uh, uh, have, have experienced some, some catastrophic event that is temporarily or, or maybe on a longer term uh, interfered with their ability to pay. We have to have procedures for either reducing or waiving their fees. Uh, 
we also need to inform patients if there are going to be additional costs. Uh, we, if there are things that are like supply costs, for example, if we're, if we're providing vision services, we don't usually cover the cost of eyeglasses. And so we, we need to tell them what those, what those expected additional costs were going to be to help them make informed choices and, and to plan for uh, what they need uh, to cover out-of-pocket costs. Refusal to pay policy. This is, this is one area where you actually may choose whether or not you're going to have a refusal to pay policy. And, and it all hinges on what you do. If, if a patient owes you money, do you in any way, uh, does that in any way uh, affect their access to care? If, for example, we don't schedule an appointment for you if you owe us money, if you're, you're, you have a delinquent account, that would, that would be a situation in which uh, refusal to pay policy is needed. Uh, you can go so far as to discharge patients from the practice for, for refusal to pay, but you have to define what refusal to pay is. Uh, you need to distinguish between refusal and inability. And, and, and again, it's, it's a, the, the board's uh, determination as to whether we're going to have such a policy. There are those health centers that simply write off uh, delinquent accounts as, as bad debt and, and keep on serving patients with no interruption in care. And if that is, is the policy, the direction that you were to go, then you don't really need a refusal to pay policy. Budget. Um, you have to have a budget that reflects your anticipated costs and expected revenues to support the project. For HRSA purposes, it, it needs to be a balanced budget. Um, you uh, most of the important things that happen around happen around budget budget are are are, uh, are approved in Hearst Central Office. So there's not really much opportunity to uh, uh, to to have compliance issue related to budget. Uh, one thing you you want to do though is if you if you are engaged in those things that are other lines of business, things that are outside of the scope of the health center project, uh, you don't put that in your budget. You 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 have to be able to document that those other activities are fully supported by the revenues they generate the resources available to them um, and and that they don't uh, they don't usurp from uh, from the, the the health center funding the the converse is not necessarily the case if you're doing some outside line of business that is profitable and you choose to use those profits to bolster the health center operation you're certainly welcome to do that and person will not complain Program monitoring data systems. This is the last one. You have to have systems to collect and organize data for your own internal management purposes, as well as for some reporting you you do to HRSA. And then this last, these last three bullets are some of the some of the key points you would want to look at. <coughs> Excuse me, particularly the uh, um, the ability to monitor not only clinical but also financial operational performance. And with that, I will turn it over to Jimmy. Okay, Dan, thank you much. So I'm going to try to share the screen. Okay. And so if everyone can there see my slides there, I'll be reviewing the governor's administrative program requirements. Uh, and we'll just slip through here. And what I will share is that there are seven governor's administrative program requirements. And I'll in fact, just go through them here as my colleagues have done. Uh, first area is needs assessment. And basically what is the needs assessment program requirement? Basically the looking to see, you have to demonstrate and document the needs of your target population and updating your service area where appropriate. And in doing that, what I've done a little bit differently, our co my colleagues and I, we each look at the compliance perspective. And what I've elected to do is just to talk about the actual elements that you must comply with to in fact meet that program requirement. For example, in needs assessment, there are a couple of things you have to do like you're in element A, you have to identify your service area at least annually. This is what this is all about here. Then you also require to do an update of your needs assessment of your target population at, once, at least once every three years. So the two main requirements of needs assessment are to identify your service area at least once or at least annually and have a needs assessment document that you do at least three at least every three years. 
And in doing that, I then talk about, well, summarize, what do you do? You make sure that this annual service review and update is listed in the board's annual calendar work plan. You complete the area review at least once a year. And again, you update your needs assessment every three years. And those are the requirements that you have to meet in order to stay compliance in this area in the admin governance requirement. Then the second uh, requirement, program requirement in governance and admin is accessible locations and hours of operation. You have to demonstrate that you provide services at times and in locations that ensure accessibility to meet the needs of your target population. And what I've shown here, you may have several locations, maybe only one location, but it has to be at a time that your patients can access care. And that's what accessible locations and hours of operation are about. And the end, I look at the various elements in this program requirement, and you have to make sure that your service sites are accessible. And again, if you think about it, if your service sites are built to code, then they would uh, meet the needs of those who have physical disability and so forth. And so you have to make sure that they are built to code, which of course they would be. And also if you have multiple sites, you have to take into consideration the distance and time it takes for your patients to travel from one location to another. Uh, when we talk about the hours, do you, are, are you open at a time that meets the needs of your patient populations? And then also this element C, documentation of sites within scope of project. What this means is that you must correctly list your sites and make sure you continually take care of them. Because if you're an FQHC, you're covered by the Federal Tort Claims Act that Connie talked about earlier. And in order for you to be covered, those sites must be listed accurately on this form 5B. That's why it's so important that that form is completed correctly. And then again, the best practices for compliance, uh, I put in here uh, something like if you do a patient satisfaction survey, you wanna make sure that you are, are querying your patients as to, hey, when do you want to get services at the, our healthcare facility? What time best meets your needs? And then you tailor the hours of operation around there. And then again, we've already stated that your form 5B must be correct. Again, that's accessible location and hours of operation. Then on the key management staff, basically what this really means is, does do you have a management staff that's appropriate for the size and needs of the organization? And what this really means is, do you have the right people in the right positions to lead your organization? And that's really evaluated by uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration. And if you have a change in leadership, that is a change in your CEO, that must be coordinated with HRSA as well uh, to get approval for the change of the new CEO. And we say approval, we use that term loosely that they must be in the loop or informed of any kind of change in your CEO. And you have to have that documentation on, on file as to that change in the CEO. And then again, there are the various elements that we look at or that you're looked at to ensure your compliance. You look at the distribution of functions of your key management staff. That is, are they, do they have enough time to do the work that they're required to do? Element B, the documentation of the key management staff position, that's not looked at on site, quite frankly. So when you do application to the federal government to part of your FQAC status, they personally actually looks at your job description to see if they are in fact compliant. Uh, their on-site reviewers do not look at job description for compliance. But also, if you do have a vacant position, do you have a process in place for filling the key management vacancies? And what are you doing to fill those positions? Again, HRSA is continually looking to see, are we in fact having these fully staffed health centers based on these procedures on the human resources side of the house? And of course, the CEO responsibilities. And what we look at here or what's being looked at here is that the CEO must be directly employed by the health center, must be directly employed by the health center before they could be under contract or, or could be part-time and all that but no, it must be a full-time employee of the health center. And then they wanna know, does the CEO report to the health center board? Because again, the CEO is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the health center. And as a result, the board only has one employee and that is the CEO. And everything below the CEO falls under the 
authority of the CEO. And so they want to make sure that, and because the board has no has no uh, authority or responsibility for directly managing the staff. That comes from the CEO only. And the Bureau or HERS is very, very uh, clear in that uh, requirement. And then conversely, that I just shared, the CEO then is responsible for supervising all the members of his or her management team. So again, the board, the CEO reports to the board and everybody else in the organization reports to the CEO is what they're looking at there. And then again, we mentioned earlier is that if there is a change in the CEO at the start of since the, your project period starts or when you receive funding from America, then of course there has to be documentation on file that uh, that uh, see that CEO change was in fact approved by by HRSA. And again, I have a slide here is that you want to make sure that you have clear, cared, and documented justification for any part time people you have on staff and your management team have a process for filling any key management vacancy positions and then make sure you have the required documentation on file uh, for a change in your CEO if that should in fact uh, happen during the course of your funding cycle. Then there's this thing about conflict of interest, another admin governance requirement. And basically I believe all of us are aware of what a conflict of interest is. And basically, uh, just the definition is listed there. If a person is in a position to get any personal benefit from the actions taken or decisions made in their official capacity, then you have a potential conflict of interest. And basically what this goes on to say is that no health center employee, officer, governing board member, or agent acting on behalf of the health center may participate in the selection or award of a contract. And basically, as Dan was talking earlier, when you get federal funds, if you receive federal funds to pay for a service in whole or in part, then of course this conflict of interest provision uh, really kicks in because we wanna make sure that if you're giving contracts that there can be no COI, no conflict of interest, because again, you have the involved with federal funds. And then there are standards and elements in this requirement you have to have the written standards of conduct that apply to the health center that spells out what, what they are. And then one of the things, uh, the requirements to ask, is, it, is your center a part of a parent affiliate or a subsidiary of another organization? The reason they do that because they don't want the parent or affiliate exerting undue influence over you, especially in your purchasing position. So we look, so that's looked at. And also, are your board members, employees, and everyone involved in this health center, are they informed of the standards of conduct um, um, provisions uh, so that they'll make sure there's no doubt that there is a conflict of interest and everyone needs to be aware of it and what are the consequences if you violate COI. And then we all, then they all wanna know, they look to see, have you had a COI or conflict of interest in the past three years uh, that was involved in procurement uh, involving federal funds. Just want to make sure that that situation has been resolved and that's a conflict of interest. And again, as we look at what do you have to do to make sure that you're compliant there is that you have to have the written standards of conduct. And then when you have your bylaws, your procurement policies, employee handbook, you want to make sure that the language in these documents are consistent as it relates to conflict of interest. And an example would be uh, the bylaws state that you can accept a $100 gift, then the employee handbook says you can only accept $25, and then the procurement policy talks about $500, even though those are, are, are far-fetched um, issues, meaning that they more, more than likely would not occur, but you wanna make sure that the verbiage always is consistent in those documents. And then also you have to have a process in place so that employees and board members and agents and officers of the health center can disclose their conflict of interest. You must have a process in place to do that. And again, as I shared earlier, there must be provisions for disciplinary actions for those health center individuals who are uh, involved in the conflict of interest. There must be disciplinary actions and for example, for board members, if there's a conflict of interest, it can include termination from the board. 
and it has to be spelled out. And again, you have to ensure that everyone associated with the health center is in fact informed of the conflict of interest standards of conduct. Then collaborative relationships. It's really all about the relationships. And basically in a nutshell, what this means is that does your health center make effort to establish and maintain collaborative relationship with other providers, agencies, and organizations in your service area, including health centers and those entities listed there, to provide access to services that are not available through the health center. Basically, what we're really getting at here is, as a health center, as an FQHC, are you working to establish and maintain relationships with other agencies and organizations that's going to benefit your patients that you serve at your health center? For example, you don't have a a cardiologist on staff, and obviously you want to have a relationship with an agency or a cardiologist or an organization that provides cardiology services. You want to have a working relationship with folk, with uh, other entities in your service area. And then you have those uh, elements that we talked about that are in the site visit protocol and the compliance manual. And, we, and it's just very straightforward. Do you make efforts to collaborate with providers or programs in your service area? Then you have to give examples of that during the uh, doing a, a review, and they look to see, are you, what are you doing to reduce non-urgent use of hospital emergency departments? What are you doing to provoke continuity of care, like a referral relationships? And also, holistically, what are you doing to ensure that your patient needs are being met? A patient comes in as being receiving medical care, but during this encounter, they say, I have no heat, I have no food, I have no clothing for my children. What do you do to, in fact, uh, you can address their medical need, but a process in place to make sure they get all the services that they need? Collaboration. And then, of course, talk about collaboration with other primary care providers. And also, uh, if that's element B, and the element C, HRSA assesses that for compliance to make sure that you're providing all the services that you're required to do under your scope of project. And then I have, uh, again, just some of the best practices that happen out there. And this really relates to, if you're undergoing a site review, the steps that you would do to make sure that you uh, demonstrated compliance with that requirement. And those items are listed there, okay? Just you document, make sure your collaboration, collaboration agreements are on file. Make sure that you have the right staff participating in reviews. Uh, make sure you know what's in your, Memorandum of understanding, your memorandum of agreements, your contracts, and so forth. And so that's where we are in terms of, again, it's all about collaboration and the relationships that I shared earlier. Now, let's kind of get into the board authority uh, very succinctly. Hey, does your board maintain appropriate authority to oversight, oversee health center operations? Basically, are you at the 50,000 foot level and managing the affairs of your health center? And just to drill down in there, basically in an FQHC, as Dr. Shabazz was sharing, no agency, entity, or organization can have authority over the health center project, over the FQHC. And then we, they look at, the, at your bylaws and your arrangements to make sure that no one has authority over the FQHC. Because again, under Section 330 of the Public Health Services Act, your FQHC is an autonomous body, autonomous body. And then you get into the board authority. Element B talks about required authorities and responsibility. Basically here, there are seven key points that the bylaws must contain in order to meet the 330 program requirements. And then translation in the bylaws do your bylaws list all that the board is required to do? And then it gets down into these bullets here, approving the selection termination of, and dismissal of the CEO, approve the annual budget, approve the services location and hours, evaluate the performance of the health center, establishing policy related to the operations of the health center, and make sure it operates in compliance with the federal, state, and local law. So basically your bylaws must contain those provisions. And then in element C, you look to see, do you also do exactly what your bylaws say that you're required to do? And then, then, we, then you have a board meetings. You must meet at least once a month over a 12-month period. 
And then it has to make sure that those elements that I talked about are documented in the board meeting minutes. And then there are policies that the board must approve. For example, as in Mr. Miles' presentation, the sliding fee discount program he talked about, that must be approved by the board. The quality improvement assurance program that Dr. Shabazz talked about, that program must be approved by the board. Building collections, these three policies must be approved by the board and documented in the board meeting minutes. And then again, just to kind of recap, you make sure that no bond has any approval of veto power over the health center and that your bylaws include all the required provisions and that you document everything that you're supposed to do and uh, ensure the board has adopted these policies that's listed there. And also there are two additional policies Dan mentioned earlier, financial management accounting system and your personnel policies, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the last area that I look at is the board composition. And basically this talks about, hey, do, does your board have the individuals or well, majority of whom, as Connie mentioned, 51% are patients served by the health center? And do they represent the demographics of the folks in your service area? So we look at that in that you know, skills, demographics, and so forth. And then we, again, look here to see there's an ongoing selection and removal process for board members. And again, we make sure that nothing limits the board's ability to remove the board chair or board members there. And then on the required board composition uh, for the attendees there, you must have at least nine to 25 members. Again, from Dr. Shabazz, 51% of whom of board members must be patients and they must represent the individual served. Just repeating that as emphasis items. And then again, it's talked about their representative of the community served and they're selected to provide relevant expertise and skills in certain areas. And kicker here, just to make sure that no more than one half of your non-patient board members can earn more than 10% of their income from the healthcare industry. And again, they ensure that that's there to ensure that it's a majority patient consumer driven board. And again, employers and immediate family members cannot be members of the board as you look at that. And the immediate family members find as a spouse, child, parent or sibling through blood or doctrine of merit, they're strictly heavy prohibition about who cannot serve on the board. Then we look at the board composition to see if in fact you are doing all those things that are talked about in the previous slide. And again, the health center board is required to verify that no one is an employee of the health center or an immediate family member of a health center employee. So again, very briefly, those are the admin governance requirements for an organization to be an FQHC. So, uh, Dr. Shabazz, Connie, that ends my part, and I'm giving it back to you. Thank you very much. And we have a, a couple of more slides just to uh, present quickly, and then uh, we're going to have our our uh, Q and I. Well, I'm going to hand it back over to to uh, Lance. But uh, so next steps. I know there are a lot of questions about well, what do we do next if we are interested in becoming a federally qualified healthcare. Uh, center applicant uh, either for a lookalike or for a 330 grant. So these, this is just some quick things. Um, Jimmy and as well as, as Dan mentioned um, references. One thing in particular is to go to the hrsa.gov website. That's H-R-S-A and look for health centers. And you're going to search for things like the pro uh, program opportunities. It'll tell you about the, the grants and the uh, lookalike program and how you can go through the application process. We also reference, we kept talking about compliance, compliance, compliance. Also look for the health center program requirements. And those will detail all of the things we've talked about have to be in place with the, the health center before you can uh, get your, either your designation as a lookalike. And if you get the reward and, and don't have your, your program fully operable, what you have to do to be in compliance. The, the next thing is assess your, your center's uh, uh, readiness. So in other words, pre prepare your health center to meet the criteria for the lookalike for the 330 grantee and organize a, a, a team to address the three key, key areas we've been talking about today, the clinical finance, admin, uh, governance and administration, and set up a, a timeline to complete tasks. Remember, you can apply at any time for the lookalike, but you, you never know when the 330 grant is coming up. And so you wanna make sure that you 
are preparing now. Just a full disclosure that, you know, uh, we, we provide these assessments and we've done mock surveys, as I, I mentioned, we, we helped uh, Iman and have done, done work with other health centers. And so, uh, but no matter what you do, be prepared. Uh, this is an intense process, but as you can see, they're great rewards. So I'm gonna hand it back over to um, Lance and thank you so much again for this opportunity. And we look forward to the questions that you have. So thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Uh, we're actually gonna turn it over to Daniel Abdullah from uh, Islamic Relief USA for an announcement. Assalamualaikum everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, as mentioned, my name is Donia Abdullah. I am the Partner Services Specialist at Islamic Relief USA. Uh, this, uh, I just wanna first and foremost, like shout you guys uh, out for this amazing uh, presentation. Um, as the Partner Services Specialist, I am tasked with overseeing all of our strategic partnerships across the nation. And that could consist of any type of project that, um, that you know, fits under the scope of our work. So food security, healthcare, um, refugee and immigrant services or community development. Uh, but now uh, IRUSA is also looking to focus more on healthcare, especially after the two years that we've had uh, together with COVID. Uh, we wanted to take that leap and make sure that there is a network. We saw the need for a network to be put together of uh, healthcare networks under our, um, uh, with our many partnerships, uh, majority Muslim led or uh, Muslim founded, so we are able to fund and grow these clinics um, since you know majority of them are you know stuck at a, a very small capacity and are looking to become exactly uh, FQHC lookalikes or FQHC uh, clinics in the coming years. So a, a webinar like this really helps out the network that I'm trying to build and put together. So we're not only trying to fund these clinics that are interested in being in this uh, and network, but we're also trying to be a, uh, a, a, a resource and in bringing information like this from, you know, the, the, uh, the professionals who know, because I'm, I'm not a uh, medical expert. I uh, don't know the exact lingo and the specific processes, but I'm tasked with, you know, making sure that I could get our clinics this information. So this was wonderful and I'm really happy I'm going to share this webinar with them if they're not already uh, joined with us here. Uh, but a little bit about the network. So um, it's it's not open to everybody. It's pretty exclusive. So what I do is I uh, do some a bit of due diligence and research into what kind of clinics are out there. And we don't only focus on clinics, you know, who have had, uh, you know, like 10 years under their belt. We're focusing on making it a mix of, you know, just starting out to uh, Umma Clinic, who's, you know, I believe 15 years or plus uh, now in the, in the healthcare game. So, uh, and that's what we love. We love bringing two different, uh, you know, sizes of a uh, partnership of uh, organization sorry in a mix so they could learn from each other challenges and uh successes obviously uh, and so we saw that that was a definite need in our network uh and COVID helped to 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 realize that so we want to be able to um share more resources like this so we could get our partners from a to z uh and make sure that they are well equipped to to voice their opinions and um, get the funding and resources that they need to be the, the best clinic or mental health agency that they could be. Um, so I'm gonna share my email in case anybody has questions or suggestions of, of clinics that might not be under our uh, network yet. We started piloting this, uh, this network this year, so we are still developing it, but it's very exciting. I'm, uh, I have an MPH myself, so I'm not too far off. I, I definitely love this type of uh, information and, you know, spreading the wealth and, you know, public health all the way. And so I, I feel like I am definitely in the right place. Uh, but I, I need the assistance from, you know, our friends like AMHP who have been a strong shoulder uh, throughout all of this and making sure that we're getting the right advocacy going on with our partners, the right resources like this webinar right here that we could share and just keep um, moving forward. Uh, so I don't wanna ramble. I, I know I probably went over my 
four or five minutes, uh, but I'm going to share my email again in the chat box. Please feel free to email me any questions you have um, or again, any suggestions of clinics that we might reach out to and invite into this network. It is looking to be a uh, you know sustainability project from, from here on out. And so we're looking to uh, invite and uh, learn from these clinics, see that they're a good fit into our network and then build each other up from there. Uh, so thank you so much, Jazakallah khair for your time. Uh, and I, I appreciate it. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Donya. I, th I think there's one question already. Um, is there a way to find out which, uh, which clinics are already in the network? Do you have that online or, or somewhere? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know if I could share that just yet, but we are in the final process of approving our uh, uh, partnerships. So I am not at liberty to just say uh, yet, but if you can just email me and then I will be able to say yes or no on one or two of uh, the, the clinics that you have. All right, thank you so much. So um, now we'll, we'll do uh, some of the questions from the chat. Um, we have uh, five or six questions that uh, Sayed and Dr. Dr. Ghada Khan have put together. Um, so if we could, we could have uh, Dr. Shabazz and Mr. Miles and, and uh, Mr. Brown join us again. So I think uh, the, the first question for Dr. Shabazz, is there a special certification or accreditation that you need for, for a lookalike? And I'm, I'm not sure in, in terms of the question, whether that's for individual providers or, or for the clinic itself, but a special certification or accreditation. No, I, and I assume that they're referring to something like JCO accreditation or NCQH. No, there's no such requirement. Thank you. And and I, I believe for, for Mr. Miles, is there a recommended sliding scale from uh, for FQHCs that the federal government shares? Well, well what they share, of course, is, is the uh, is, is the poverty guidelines that come out usually January, February of every year. Uh, your scale has to be tied to that. And, and um, I would suggest, uh, you know, contacting PCAs, contacting neighbor health, neighboring health centers. Uh, you'll, you'll find variations. You, uh, admission, you have to have uh, either no charge or a fixed nominal charge. Most health centers will charge some fixed uh, amount to patients that are below 100% of poverty. Uh, between 100% and 200%, you have to have at least three levels of discount. You can have more, and some do. Uh, I've seen as many as 10. 10's kind of a lot to keep up with for no particular good reason, but uh, but you, at least three. And, and that can be fixed dollar amounts, that can be percentages. And, and again, I think if you if you call some of your neighbors and see what they're doing, you'll, you'll get a good feel for, uh, for, for what's typical. Um, uh, but beyond that, you just want to be careful about the math. Uh, be sure that when we get to 200% of poverty, it is in fact exactly double 100%. I, I see I see these sliding fee scales that are set up on on a formula basis, and then somebody updates part of it, and the rest of it doesn't get updated. So suddenly it's out of compliance. Doesn't look like the federal poverty guidelines anymore, and and of course they change every year, so that they have to be updated. We have to keep up with that, but there's no, but there's no standard set of like, you know, the no, discount. Not really. Rate. It's, 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 the health centers have a lot of latitude, really. And that's, that's one of the areas of, of latitude they have. They decide how many levels of discount, how deep those discounts will be. Uh, they just have to be sure that they cover all services, whether they provide them or, or do them through referral. Uh, and, and many times, the, the feedback, the patient feedback I mentioned that tells us that health centers, uh, the, the, the health center patients consider this nominal, uh, oftentimes that's coming from consumer members of the board and that's perfectly fine. Uh, you can, you can you know, if you want the broadest possible feedback then survey all your patients, but, uh, uh, but many times you have to make a decision and, and board input is good. And then you, you monitor utilization services to be sure that we didn't, uh, create a barrier. Okay, thank you. Um, and are, are there any special considerations? I think this is for uh, for anyone. But uh, are are there any special considerations for mental health clinics? 
uh, in an FQHC context or a mental health clinic as an FQHC? Well, any any new newly funded health center would have to have mental health services, either either providing them directly or doing through referral. So yeah, there's there is uh, it, it's a required component of of being an FQHC or a lookalike. And okay. we're finding in, in recent years there are a lot of mental health uh, organizations that are becoming FQHCs. I see. So um, and and so you don't you can be a mental health a mental health primarily mental health clinic and be an FQHC. You don't Absolutely. have to have all the primary care and other. Um, Absolutely. And, and I discussed with someone uh, recently about this. Um, and I hope they're on and they have a women's clinic. Uh, but I said, you can also have a, a like a 330 program just for a community health, just for that subset of patients who would be best be served and still have your, your women's clinic. As long as you're adhering to the requirements, you know, for them that are required by the money that you get from, from the Bureau and using that specifically for that population that you're serving under that grant. Okay, so these can be targeted funds for particular populations. Absolutely. Services. So um, are there, speaking of which, are there grants to fund non-allopathic or alternative or as you say, integrative medicine uh, as a part of your your clinic? Okay, all right. Well, actually I'm, I'm in the process of, well, um, actually opening up a such a health center. And so okay. what we're doing is we're integrating uh, the allopathic as well as the, uh, the uh, complementary medicine together. And so uh, their health centers, a lot of them really in uh, the Western corridor in, in California that have those models already. And so the, the Bureau does allow for coverage under scope for some of those uh, modalities. So it can be done. You you also see it with uh, uh, IHS. Uh, there 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 are are uh, jointly funded IHS and 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 uh, HRSA funded health centers that will incorporate a lot of traditional tribal medicine. Right. Okay. Right. So that's IHS Indian is health the health service and, and that's Indian health service. Yes. Thank you. So um, and we have another questions about uh, are there board requirement waivers given commonly by HRSA? When you say uh, Gans uh, Brown here, board requirement waivers, uh, the answer to that is no. There, when you say waivers, basically, but again, that's sort of a blanket statement, but it means what type of waiver. If you talk about like for the number of members on the board or to hold monthly meetings, those types of things, no, those are program requirements that you have to comply with. However, there are some instances whereby there may be a waiver for say a patient majority board. When I say that, if you're in an isolated area and you can't find enough people to actually serve on that board because it has to be um, uh, membership wise, you may get some type of membership waiver, but you'd have to have a consumer advisory board that's attached to the health center that also makes sure there's input coming from folk from a non-patient members of the board. So yes, when I say waivers, it would just be an individual circumstance that have to be looked at for the board to actually grant a waiver. But when you start talking about membership and meetings and all those seven requirements that I talked about, uh, there are no real waivers for that. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's not so much a matter of choice. It's built into the legislation that not much of that. Right. And that's why I answered no so quickly. However, you know, there's always some type of exception, minor, minor loophole exception that it'd have to be looked at just to see uh, if there's some extenuating circumstance. But as Dan said, that's the legislation that's there. Uh, but Thank Jimmy, uh, what about the uh, homeless population? The, the... Now, now I'm going to say like homeless. And again, if you receive special population funding, you must have a representative from the homeless community serve on your board. Is that what you're driving at, Connie? Yes, I, have I, I know the provision where the, it uh, didn't necessarily have to be a person who was experiencing homelessness, but someone who may be working with a homeless shelter. Oh, oh absolutely. And again, that, that's a good point. But, and so let's just make sure we fully uh, uh, hash this out. If you receive 
pun funding Cunny actually showed you there are like three different or four different areas that you receive funding, like 330 F D F G and I and so forth. If you receive monies, then you must have representation from those groups of individuals uh, on your board. And again, you don't have to be homeless, but you must have experience working in the homeless industry. You could have been involved as a leader or manager or some association with homelessness. So yeah, so there's some revisions for that. And there, and in those those homeless uh, uh, grantees, uh, they usually do have consumer advisory boards who mm -hmm. are homeless individuals. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, there's a, a follow-up question about whether the CEO can be on the board. No, the CEO is an ex officio member of the board. He or she uh, attends board meetings, participates in the board, because obviously they're the most knowledgeable, but they, they don't get to vote. They don't get to vote. But the CEO is definitely an ex officio member of the board, for sure. Okay. We have we have another question about are there are there guidelines available that offer guidance in a transition to an FQHC from being a nonprofit community clinic, say one of the Muslim free clinics, for example, I, the um, the question says I would assume bylaws would need to be rewritten and a new board would need to be formed, or does the health center nonprofit continue, and a specific FQHC board get created. Well, let me take a stab at the latter part of the person, and maybe Dr. Shabazz and Dan can pump in on the other part. And when we talk about governance and administration fees, the FQHC must have a board that's autonomous to its, in its operations. Now, when you have different entities coming aboard and, and mixing and matching and so forth, but as long as there's a board that is not responsible to another board, then that situation can exist. See, and again, it's more like what you uh, described, sir, is that as long as that FQAC has its own independent standalone board that governs the FQAC operations, then, then that's fine, okay? If that's good, but it has to be independent and autonomous and not subservient to another board. Or the FQAC board may have multiple oversight over multiple organizations, say, it's a lateral relationship, but it cannot be uh, a, a, a horizontal relationship in terms of board board member, board oversight. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to, to answer the, the part of the question with regards to uh, their guidance out there. Um, what was mentioned earlier was the term PCA, that's a primary care association. Uh, practically every state has a primary care association. Some of the smaller states, they, they may actually coalesce three, two or three states together, but they provide a wealth of information to health centers who are organizations that are uh, looking to become lookalikes or FQHCs. So that's a starting point. The National Association of Community Health Centers uh, is out of Washington, and that pretty much is the umbrella over uh, all of these uh, primary care associations. Uh, another thing I would recommend is uh, you know, looking at your your, uh, your local primary care association and talking to other health centers. There is a, a handbook actually that the National Association put out some years ago. I don't know how, how updated it is, but there is a handbook, a kind of a guidance to health centers. Um, and it really targets new health centers, but it's a great guidance for you to look into it, NAC, at NAC, National Association Community Health Center, that could help you to, to prepare your health center to transition from, say, a free and charitable clinic to either a, a lookalike or a 330 grantee. Yeah, and, and I think what you've already mentioned, the compliance manual, uh, particularly the governance piece uh, to, to, to respond to some of the questions about bylaws, et cetera. Uh, you, 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 we've, we've kind of hit the high spots, but there is a, a myriad of detail uh, that, that you want to be conversant with to, to know uh, what you need in place. Sounds like there's a myriad of detail to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So are there, um, I'm interested in this, this question, are there any uh, restrictions uh, around FQHCs for faith-based organizations? 
Okay, I knew that was coming. No, <laughs> as long as you are not denying people care based on their religious affiliation or political affi affiliation, that's a no-no, okay? Or you're you know, pr proselytizing and using you know, dollars mm -hmm. for your dawa, you know, uh, pamphlets or things like that. As long as you're not you know, using that as a wedge between somebody getting care. Uh, then mm -hmm. there's no restriction. There are plenty of, like, you know, Uma and, you know, uh, Iman and others, uh, there are plenty who, who they have not had to separate, you know, uh, in terms of their religious faith and practices because of that. that there's no restriction as far as that's concerned. I think that one of the reasons that I find that, that question particularly interesting is I, I recall when we first started doing the research, you know, 13 years ago, on, uh, on Muslim clinics before any of them had become FQHCs. Uh, and a couple were in transition and they were thinking about this requirement of 51% um, uh, patient consumer uh, on the board. Uh, and when they were serving a, a majority non-Muslim community, um, you know, how does that affect the composition of your board and your ability to sort of shape the practices according to faith? Right. Uh -huh. And Jimmy will attest to this as well as Dan, you know, you know, it's sometimes it's very hard to get boards again. It doesn't matter if everybody's from the, <laughs> the same community, it's hard because of the commitment. And, and so that's yes. why it's a skill set that, you know, you want to start. And the reason why I really think it's so powerful that, that it's a 51% user because it is an, a way to empower the communities to have control over their own destiny in terms of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And so it may take a while, but you know, getting people to come on and not necessarily throwing them into the fire, but trying to recruit like uh, from people who actually use the services that that's really critical and then giving them the support that they need. And sometimes mm -hmm. that support may even be translation support. You know, making them feel like they they are appreciated that, that you really want them to have a, a, a say so and be a part of the the this patient centered or community based health center uh, movement. So that's all I could say on that. Jimmy, maybe maybe you and Dan have those something. No, I, I I totally agree, uh, Connie. You hit the nail right on the head, and I understand Dr. Laird's question there. So yes, that's that's the the very most appropriate answer there. And, and and going back a little bit um, to the last question, the uh, you know NAC is a, is a good resource for board development, for board training, uh, and and so again, if 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 we need help transitioning, I'm sorry, just kind of jump back into the last question mm -hmm. here, but but just transitioning, uh, those those that can be really fruitful uh, educational opportunities to 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 be sure that we are 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 understanding and, and, and prepared to do what we need to. Well, I, I want to uh, want to thank you all very much. Thank the, the panelists um, and Donya. And again, thanks to Islamic Relief USA and to the American Muslim Health Professionals for, uh, for hosting this very informative, uh, very detailed presentation on uh, federally qualified health centers. Um, and you have the contact information for, uh, for Dr. Shabazz and the, um, and the consultants here. Um, please contact us with, uh, with other questions. Contact Dr. Shabazz. The recording will be available um, through AMHP. Um, and I thank you all for joining us this evening. This has been a wonderful, very informative um, uh, webinar. So, Jazakum Allah Khair. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Our pleasure. Thanks.